Ashen-faced villagers walk in a solemn line down a long dirt road. The light from their torches makes their faces into masks of shadows. They chant in an ancient and arcane language as they move in a procession towards the darkened cemetery on the edge of the village. It's an unpleasant duty, but a burden that they must carry nonetheless. In the middle of the procession is the one being honored tonight, one of the village elders. And in this village, to be an elder is a truly special thing. From his wizened, creaking body, his deep-set eyes milky with cataracts, his almost transparent, liver-spotted skin, it would appear that he is in his 90s. But in fact, he is over 300 years old. The other villagers pass ghost-like through the gates of the cemetery, crowding around the elder as he hobbles across the uneven terrain. It will be his final pilgrimage, and all of them, including him, know it. He breathes a ragged sigh and mutters a prayer to the deity that he will soon be meeting. Up above, the moon shines brilliantly. Down below, a chasm yawns in an open grave with something very old and very powerful roiling underneath. The villagers do not fear it. They revere it. They worship it. It gave them everything they have. The elder stands at the mouth of the chasm, staring down into its depths with resolute silence. The village priest opens an ancient book and chants a rite in an antique tongue. His words translate roughly to, To our Lord, our Father, our Protector, we commit one of our own back into your hands and heart. For one thing is immutably true. The black gift is only borrowed. The black gift gives us our life. And in death, we return to the Black God. As he goes on, something rises from the pit, tendrils molded from liquid dark. They reach out and embrace the Elder, tenderly wrapping around him and lifting him from the ground. He doesn't scream, though. He simply accepts his fate as the villagers pray, and the tendrils pull him down into the dark. When their prayer is done, there is only silence. The torches go out. The villagers return home. It's just another night for them. There is a village in the deepest, darkest reaches of Eastern Europe, a place forgotten by time, where the locals live by old rules and even older gods, a place where strange rituals occur and people with unnatural abilities thrive. And beneath it all, the blood of a hungry, curious god runs in endless, dark rivers. It goes without saying, something incredibly strange is afoot in Chemnosht, Poland, and the SCP Foundation have designated the heart of the strangeness as SCP-6198. However, the decidedly peculiar locals have a very different name for the phenomenon, Chernobog, Old Slavic for the Black God, an ancient deity said to rule dark fates in the underworld. And considering the events that unfolded in the incredibly old, incredibly isolated village of Chemnosht, this is a reputation that Chernobog has very much earned. Sadly, several members of Foundation personnel had to learn this the hard way. The Foundation first discovered the village when they intercepted strange communications from the local authorities investigating a missing persons case from the Lower Silesian Forest region. While searching for this missing person, Polish police found a series of strange, dark chasms in the ground, each one leading down to a deep, mysterious pit filled with black liquid. This was enough for the Foundation to realize something anomalous was likely occurring here, prompting them to step in and intervene. Before the authorities could arrange any potentially dangerous excursions into one of these chasms, the SCP Foundation showed up under the guise of Poland's Ministry of Public Security and relieved them of their duties. They designated the strange black liquid in the chasms SCP-6198-B and the chasms themselves as SCP-6198-C. Thankfully, while the locals weren't exactly rolling out the welcome wagon, they didn't show active hostility either. Most simply appeared wary and kept their distance, watching Foundation activities from inside their homes and staying out of the way of researchers and guards. Early on, one of the biggest issues was the communication barrier as the majority of the village spoke an otherwise dead Proto-Slavic dialect that seemed impenetrable even to modern Polish speakers. Linguistic experts became key to facilitating later communications between Foundation personnel and residents of the village. The residents of the village were all quite old, but appeared unusually youthful for their ages. They were all worshippers of Chernobog. 
and the villagers claimed that through worshipping Chernobog, they were given the black gift, facilitated by imbibing the dark liquid from the chasms, which they credited with their health, youth, and longevity. The Foundation was obviously interested in figuring out just what exactly this black liquid was, so they began their studying in earnest, but they soon realized something very strange. The chasms were not always there. It seemed that they would only appear for 14-day periods between the new and full moon. The initial exploration into the heart of the village was performed by two intrepid field agents, Agent Kazmierz Nowak and Agent Maria Bakula. Nowak and Bakula arrived in the dilapidated town, finally realizing just how cut off from modern society the place was. Dirt roads, ramshackle wooden buildings surrounded by old ruins, and strange makeshift hierograms everywhere. The duo pulled into town, seeing the many ashen faces of the locals staring at them from nearby windows. They proceeded to the cemetery, where the majority of the chasms were believed to have opened. There, in what appeared to be an open grave, they found themselves staring down into one of the many abysses. Dark, light-absorbing liquid roiled deep below. However, they soon realized that it was time to go when they noticed locals hiding behind the gravestones around them, watching intently. Something was very wrong here. They traveled back into the center of the village, still keenly aware that they were being observed from the sidelines. They approached one of the many houses and attempted to knock. An extremely old woman peered out of the window and began speaking to them in Proto-Slavic, which neither of them could understand. However, as they were leaving, one of them was able to swipe a leather-bound book from a table outside the home, believed to be some kind of Bible for the local religion. While still in town, and still being watched, the duo collected a sample of the black gift from a local well, then began making their way back to their vehicle. The whole time, they were followed by an eerie old man who looked to be in his 90s, but was surprisingly spry for his age. The two left shortly after that, and shared their findings and samples with their superiors. The leather-bound book retrieved by Agent Nowak and Agent Bakula was given to SCP Foundation linguistic expert researcher Albin Iskra. Researcher Iskra quickly became enraptured with the book, and the unique challenge it and its Proto-Slavic dialect presented. After many long nights of poring over books on Slavic linguistic history and many pots of very strong coffee, researcher Iskra's work finally bore fruit. In a note to other personnel working on the SCP-6198 case, she wrote, Let me start by saying that, despite my extensive knowledge of the history and origins of Slavic language, this is the first time I've ever encountered what appears to be proto-Slavic in written form from a direct descendant source. This is a truly fascinating discovery. Initial progress on translating the text was slower than expected. There's something about the linguistic structure of the language that, for reasons I can't fully deduce, make it incredibly difficult to retain the knowledge of. For every few words committed to memory, it's as though one dissipates from it. It's as if I can feel a sense of reluctance coming from the language itself. Eventually, I was able to solidify my understanding enough to begin picking at the various passages found throughout. I can confirm that the contents of the book hold a great deal of religious significance, not only for those in Chemnost, but throughout all Slavic culture, dating back to roughly the 4th century. While there are references to the more well-known Slavic gods such as Perun and Veles, the book focuses primarily on one of the sibling successor gods, Chernobog, the Black God, detailing various prayers, rituals, and tenets that followers of the Black God should live by and practice. I've highlighted a selection of excerpts of notable interest that may shed some light on the occurrences witnessed by Foundation personnel. Three areas of interest in researcher Iskra's translation are the Rite of the Black Passage, Expurgation and the Black Gift, and the Fall of Velas, each of which, in their own way, shed some light and some darkness on the cryptic happenings of Chemnost. The section on the Rite of the Black Passage read, For it is to him where the dead must go and return to the roiling abyss from which our forms are molded to be one again with him. In this, we share in their fathomless knowledge and learn of untold and forgotten epics, unfurling mysteries of Stygian transcendence, bestowed with blessings beyond death. At darkest hour, on darkest night, within lamented dwelling hollows, shall Hypogean thresholds unveil entwining submerged departed. Now relinquished of tethers corporeal and sustained amidst black waters, become one with perennial ancestry, granting insight to those adherent. The section marked Expurgation and the Black Gift read, 
There are those that only turn to Chernobog when their time is at an end, and it is those that shall be offered the least when they inevitably pass. To live solely in the light of the brother is to neglect the eternity that follows, condemning oneself to the lowest echelons of consciousness. Those with wisdom and foresight do well to embrace the black gift, to forfeit a part of oneself in exchange for parts of the many. To drink of the black gift is to offer one's life in a bid to be tested of mind and spirit. Should one be deemed worthy, that which was offered will be returned, but with boundless acuity and vigor. Should one's offering fall short, their essence is given to the black god entirely. Yet, the truer they walk the black path, the more openly their soul shall be welcomed. Before one is to be tested, they must first be expurgated through ritual, else any sense of self is lost upon passing. This ebonizes the soul, proving devotion to the black path and allowing one's essence to find greater connection upon being taken in by Chernobog. The ritual must be carried out by followers in the living realm now sustained by the black gift, with these followers bringing about a trance of blindness and drowning within the aspirant. Should an aspirant prove resolute throughout this trial of panic terror and asphyxiation, the black gift is then offered and true judgment begins. And finally, the section labeled The Fall of Velus offers a mythological origin for the black god Chernobog himself. It read, Velus, god of the harvest, livestock, earth, rivers, the underworld, magic, and trickery. Much did humanity depend upon him for not only the means to survive, but also for peaceful death. Alas, where there are those with great power, there are also those that seek to claim it for themselves. And in this, brothers Bellabog and Chernobog were no different. Harsh winter followed by foul harvest led to the death of the brothers' village, leaving the dead unburied atop frozen ground. Enraged at the neglect Velus had dealt them, and adamant that between them they could govern the lands of the living and the dead better than the great god, the brothers set out in search of Velus, their minds intent on deicide. In their journeys, the brothers overcome many challenges, redoubling their affinity in magic and honing their cunning in warfare, Bellabog excelling in martial guile as Chernobog mastered the spell. However, Velus watched the brothers, aware of their quest. In a bid to undermine them, Velus returned the body of their mother to the living world to convince them to return home with her. The brothers were not fooled, and with a heavy heart, returned their mother to the underworld. Velus continued to break their will, turning the food they gathered rotten. But again, the brothers were not fooled, as they endured putrid illusion of smell and taste, knowing that in truth what they consumed would nourish them. Every trick cast down by Velus was foreseen and averted, until eventually, Frustrated at the brothers' tenacity, Velus himself confronted Bellabog and Chernobog. Velus challenged the brothers to battle, offering his godhood should they best him, but on the condition that only one may fight him. Suspecting that Velus may attempt to divide the two, the brothers had made a pact with Perun, Velus's adversary. The brothers agreed that Velus would indeed fight only a single combatant, to which Velus acknowledged and drew up a boundary from which to battle within. When asked who shall fight, the brothers announced, Perun, and upon uttering his name, the god of thunder appeared with a great flash within the boundary. A battle of world-shattering magnitude commenced as Velus took the form of a dragon and Perun harnessed the power of the skies. Despite his skill in magic and deceit, Velus was struck down and killed by Perun. With Velus dead, Bellabog claimed domain over harvest, the earth, and livestock, as Chernobog claimed the underworld, the rivers, and magic. Combining information from these extracts with contextual information they'd gathered from observation allowed them to paint a more complete picture of the goings-on at Chemnost, as well as SCP-6198 itself. But to develop an even greater understanding of what they were dealing with here, they'd need to open a dialogue with a friendly member of the village. That villager ended up being Tessia Konieczny, a woman who appeared to be middle-aged but was, in actuality, in her mid-70s her youthful, outward appearance owing to the positive effects of the black gift. Tessia was pleasant and forthcoming with her information as Foundation researchers questioned her, allowing them to glean a variety of interesting information. For example, the black gift is exclusive to those who were born in Chemnost, and many worshippers used to make their pilgrimage to Chemnost to pledge their bodies to Chernobog in their final moments and become one with him. Tessia also seemed to possess information that either would have predated her life or would be impossible for her to know. 
suggesting a shared consciousness between those who had been given the black gift. The question of what it exactly meant to offer oneself to Chernobog continued to linger until the Foundation began to conduct tests with the samples collected by Agent Nowak and Agent Bakula. Given that, supposedly, only people born in Chemnost could receive the black gift, the Foundation was eager to discover what effect the black liquid might have on a D-class. Incidentally, despite being truly opaque in any quantity, chemical tests showed that the composition of the black liquid was no different from water. So how severe could the effects really be? When a sample was applied to a D-class subject's skin, there were no noticeable effects, nor were there any when the D-class was submerged up to the neck in the substance. When given diving equipment and entirely submerged in the liquid, still nothing happened. However, when the D-class was instructed to drink a glass of the liquid, he became incredibly ill, his veins and then skin turning black. He quickly expired, and his body rapidly decomposed into more of the same black liquid. This implied that it was all part of the life cycle of Chemnost. The black gift sustains life, but when life finally comes to an end, everyone rejoins Chernobog and becomes the same black liquid that sustains the next generation of worshippers. Also, when a sample was given to a Chemnost native to drink, there were no noticeable effects. After all this, the SCP Foundation decided it was finally time to lower a member of their own personnel into one of the SCP-6198 chasms to better figure out what was inside. This, however, was the beginning of the troubles that would alert the Foundation to the true danger presented by SCP-6198 and his worshippers. Researcher Ella Gorsky agreed to suit up and be lowered into the blackness of one of the chasms and report back what happened within. As expected, when she was lowered in, she reported the eerie darkness around her and the black liquid that seemed to almost have a mind of its own. When they attempted to pull her out, there was evidence of spatial distortion, as despite being theoretically raised enough to leave the underwater cavern, she was still down there. It was at this point that researcher Gorsky began to talk to someone who wasn't there concerning the research staff up above. When they tried to raise her, they realized that something was terribly wrong. Researcher Gorsky was gone. She'd been absorbed, body and mind, into the great collective consciousness of Chernobog. The entity begged in Gorsky's voice, There is nothing of interest to be found within this abyss. The only knowledge worth seeking is above us. Please, send more foundation. Please, I must survive. This was how the SCP Foundation gleaned another extremely valuable piece of information. Chernobog is able to grow stronger based on his number of victims and worshippers, as more minds and memories are absorbed into his great collective consciousness. And disturbingly, after consuming researcher Gorsky, he knew about the SCP Foundation, and he was extremely, extremely eager to know more. This was when things took a turn for the worst. In the hours following the disappearance of researcher Gorsky, a mobile task force unit was dispatched from Site 120 to assist in the search. As they searched, various townsfolk approached Foundation staff and began questioning them on subjects that they had no business knowing about, such as the fate of researcher Gorsky, the status of various anomalies in the region, and the location of the O5 Council, which led Foundation agents to detaining the villager who asked that last particularly dangerous question. But the worst was yet to come. The Foundation first had to stop a bizarre ritual where some of the villagers began taking bucketfuls of water from the village well and bringing it to the different houses, and it took intervention from the mobile task force unit on site to get them to stop. And not long after that, one of the MTF members, Agent Adam Kowalski, didn't report back for duty. The remaining MTF members began searching for their missing colleague, but at the same time, villagers also began attacking the task force members at the cemetery, forcing them to fight their way back into town. When the embattled group entered a suspicious house, they found a startling sight. A room filled with dark chasms surrounded by makeshift paintings of the SCP Foundation's logo. Further in, they discovered Agent Kowalski laying on the ground with two villagers appearing to pray over him. When nothing else would make them stop, they were forced to neutralize the two villagers and retrieve the comatose Agent Kowalski for evacuation from the village. The villagers crowded around the center of the village as the MTF members approached with Kowalski in tow. After being forced to kill several more villagers, the crowd finally parted and allowed them through. During the car ride out of the village, Agent Kowalski briefly became semi-lucid and muttered about something black watching him from beneath the water. He was able to provide no other information on what had happened to him, and just moments later, he died of cardiac arrest. 
Security footage would then show something extremely disturbing occurring within the MTF vehicle. Agent Kowalski's dead body sat up, retrieved his gun, and then killed his fellow MTF squadmates before they even had a chance to react. The driver of the car was seriously wounded and the vehicle crashed. Agent Kowalski's reanimated body then exited the vehicle and screaming could be heard as he pulled the injured driver from his seat and dragged him away into the darkness. The sounds of begging, vomiting, and wheezing were heard after that, as we can only assume he was forced to ingest the black gift. No bodies were ever recovered, just various MTF uniforms floating in black liquid near the road sign. Since this incident, the SCP Foundation has dealt with the village of Chemnost and SCP-6198 with increased caution. Agent Kowalski's reanimated corpse remains at large, and regular searches are conducted for it in the Lower Silesian Forest since it is vital, above all else, that Chernobog cannot come to know any more sensitive SCP Foundation information than he already does. Due to his intelligent nature and capacity to learn and exploit SCP Foundation secrets, Chernobog has been given the Euclid Object Class, and files pertaining to Chernobog are classified to Level 3 personnel and above. The entity has been given the Disruption Class Vlam, as it is thankfully currently localized entirely to the village of Chemnost, Poland. And given the recent events that have unfolded there, it has also been given the Risk Class Caution, since there's no way of knowing what the Black God still has up his sleeve. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-783, There Was a Crooked Man, for another anomalous location inhabited by a powerful and dangerous being. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.